Welcome to IGCSE Chemistry. In this video we will look at how the particles are arranged in solids, liquids and gases and think about the energy these particles have and how that changes when they change from one state to another. We'll then go on to look at how the different states of substances make it possible to separate them from various types of mixture such as solutions. If we were able to look at the individual particles in a solid that is the ions or molecules from which it's made, we would be able to see that they're arranged in regular patterns and that the particles don't move from place to place, but they do vibrate about their fixed position. This tells us that there must be forces acting between the particles which are strong enough to stop the particles separating from one another. The substance remains solid because the particles do not have enough energy to overcome these forces between them. In a liquid, the particles have more energy, sufficient to overcome the forces holding the particles together so that they are able to move around as well as vibrate. Nonetheless, there are still forces acting between the particles which hold them together as a pool of liquid, preventing them from escaping into the rest of the container. In a gas, the particles have sufficient energy to completely overcome the forces that attract them to one another so that the particles are able to move freely within the volume containing the gas, as well as vibrate. We can see that for a given substance, for example water, the particles in the solid, ice, have least energy, the particles in the liquid, water, have more energy, and the particles in the gaseous steam have the most energy. It's good to have models that explain how the particles behave, but to be useful models we need evidence that the models are correct. Evidence that the particles in a liquid are able to move freely comes from diffusion experiments. If a crystal of potassium permanganate is placed in a beaker of water, it slowly dissolves, and the purple manganate ions mix with the water to form a solution. The water around the crystal turns purple, and because the permanganate ions in the solution are free to move, the purple colour progressively spreads through the solution until a uniform purple colour is seen. The same effect can be seen if a drop of ink is added to water. Evidence of the random movement of the water and ink particles is seen as the ink spreads throughout the solution. Diffusion experiments can also provide evidence that gas particles are in constant, random motion. Cotton wool soaked in concentrated ammonia solution and concentrated hydrochloric acid solution are placed at either end of a glass tube. Molecules of ammonia vapour start to diffuse down the tube from one end, while molecules of hydrogen chloride vapour start to diffuse from the opposite direction. Where the two gases meet, they react, forming a white ring of ammonium chloride particles in the air. This can be even easier to visualise if we put a strip of universal indicator paper down the tube, since ammonia is a base and turns the indicator paper blue-green, while hydrogen chloride is an acid and turns the indicator paper red. Where the two gases meet and a neutralisation reaction occurs, the indicator paper shows a narrow band of its neutral colour, at the same point where the smoke ring of ammonium chloride is forming. The position of the smoke ring in the tube provides a valuable insight into how the particles are moving. We can measure how far from each end of the tube the smoke ring is, and this tells us about how fast the ammonia gas and hydrogen chloride gas particles are moving on average. We find that the smoke ring forms nearer to the hydrogen chloride end of the tube, because the ammonia gas particles are lighter and therefore moving more quickly than the hydrogen chloride, so they manage to get further down the tube before they react. If we start with a solid substance and increase its temperature, it will melt and become a liquid when it reaches its melting point. And if we further increase the temperature, it will boil and become a gas when it reaches its boiling point. Some substances go straight from solid to gas without becoming a liquid. This is called sublimation. When we put heat energy into a substance, we expect its temperature to increase. If we monitor the temperature of a substance as we heat it, we will find that when a solid reaches its melting point, its temperature stops increasing. 
Instead, the energy we're providing is used to overcome the forces of attraction holding the particles in the solid in place, so that it can become a liquid. Once all the solid has melted, the temperature continues to increase. The same effect is seen at the boiling point, where the temperature of the liquid stops increasing until it's all boiled, after which the temperature of the gas continues to increase as we heat it. Starting with a gas and cooling it down, the gas will first reach its boiling point, at which temperature it will condense and form a liquid. As we continue to cool, the liquid will reach its melting point, at which temperature it will freeze and form the solid. When a substance cools, the heat energy in a substance is being transferred from that substance to the surroundings, so the temperature of the substance is decreasing. If we plot the temperature versus time as a gas cools to become a liquid and then a solid, we will see that during condensation the temperature does not decrease until all the gas has become liquid. Similarly, during freezing, the temperature does not decrease as the liquid becomes solid. This is because it is not the heat energy in the substance that's being lost to the surroundings during these changes, but the energy produced by the attractive forces between the particles as they lock together to prevent the particles moving about. Now that we understand the states of matter and how these are changed, we can apply this understanding to separating a variety of mixtures. We might, for example, want to get the precipitate out of a solution where it was formed, or make crystals of a solid from a solution, or separate the different colouring additives used in a food, or extract the alcohol from a sample of wine. The technique of filtering is used to separate a solid from a mixture containing a solid in a liquid or solution. For example, separating a precipitate from the solution in which it was formed. The mixture is poured into a funnel containing a filter paper. The solid residue remains in the filter paper, while the liquid filtrate passes through the filter paper to be collected separately. Because of the attractive forces between the solid particles, they form pieces of the solid material which are too large to pass through the tiny pores in the filter paper. Crystallization is a technique which uses evaporation to remove a solvent from a solution in order to leave the dissolved material behind as crystals. Make sure that you know the difference between the words solute, which is the dissolved solid material, solvent, the liquid in which the solid is dissolved, and solution, the mixture of the two. Crystallization works because, as the solution is heated, the solvent molecules evaporate and are removed from the solution. The solution becomes more and more concentrated until it's saturated, when it can contain no more dissolved material. Further evaporation of the solvent causes crystals of the solute to form in the solution until all the solvent has been removed and only the crystals remain. If crystallization is incomplete, the crystals can be removed from the last of the remaining solution by filtration, after which they should be dried, for example in a warm oven. Simple distillation is used to obtain the solvent from a solution. The most significant industrial example is the desalination of seawater in desert countries to provide a supply of pure water for drinking and washing. It works because the solution can be heated to the boiling point of the solvent, at which point the solution boils and the solvent molecules become gas. The vapour enters the condenser, where it's cooled to below its boiling point so it turns back into a liquid, and then it can run through the condenser to be collected. We call the collected liquid the distillate. Fractional distillation works in a very similar way, and is used to separate the liquids in a mixture of liquids, for example, separating the hydrocarbons in crude oil into different fractions. It can also be used to separate the alcohol from the water in an alcoholic solution, such as wine. Bioethanol, for use as a fuel, is separated from the solution in which it's made in this way. At very low temperatures, it can also be used to separate the gases in a mixture of gases. This is how nitrogen, oxygen and the noble gases are obtained from the air. Fractional distillation works on the principle that the different liquids in the mixture will have different boiling points due to the different size of the molecules and the strength of their attractive forces between them. 
As the mixture of liquids is heated up, each liquid reaches its boiling point at a different temperature and is turned into a gas to be cooled in the condenser and collected separately. Paper chromatography is a technique which allows different substances such as colouring additives in foods, paints, inks or cosmetics to be separated for analysis. It works on the basis that the more soluble a substance is, the faster it will be carried along by the solvent when the solvent soaks its way up a piece of chromatography paper. In this way the most soluble additives move furthest from their starting point and the least soluble ones move the least distance. The chromatography experiment begins with a pencil base line drawn on the chromatography paper. Onto this is placed a spot of the mixture to be analysed and alongside it reference spots of some of the pure additives which are thought to be in the mixture. The bottom of the chromatography paper is then dipped into a suitable solvent which soaks slowly up the paper carrying the various components in the spots up the paper at various rates depending on their solubilities. When the solvent gets near to the top of the paper its position is marked and the paper is removed from the solvent and allowed to dry. Each spot in the chromatogram corresponds to one additive substance, so the number of different additives in the mixture can be seen from the number of spots, although sometimes additives have similar solubilities so the spots can overlap. By matching the colour and position of the spots from the mixture with the spots from the reference materials, it's possible to identify which of the reference materials were in the mixture. In our example, the unknown contains three colouring additives. The long blue spot matches reference material A, so the unknown mixture contained A. The orange spot matches reference material C, so the mixture also contained C. We can conclude that there is none of the reference material B in the unknown mixture, and that the mixture contains a third colour additive which we haven't yet identified, so further experiments will be necessary. We can assign a numerical value called an RF or retardation factor to each spot to help us to identify it in tables of known RF values. The RF is the relative distance the spot has travelled compared to how far the solvent travelled, so it is given by the distance the spot moved from the baseline divided by the distance the solvent moved from the baseline. The common mistake here is measuring from the bottom of the paper rather than the baseline, so take care not to do this. For example, for reference material C, the spot has travelled 8.4 cm, while the solvent has travelled 12.8 cm, so we can calculate the RF for this substance as 8.4 over 12.8, which is 0.66 to two significant figures. Here's the result of a chromatography experiment where spots from two foods containing colouring additives were analysed alongside four different yellow colouring materials which might be in the foods. Pause the video whilst you look at the results and note down as many conclusions as you can from these results. Here are the conclusions you can draw from these results. The yellow brightie only contains one colouring additive which matches with sunburst yellow. The orange brightie contains three additives, one of which is solar yellow and another of which is sunny yellow. The third additive does not match any of the reference materials so further experiments will be necessary to identify this. Finally, we can say that neither of the foods contains mellow yellow.